back to the main track, which is Carnap and the post-Carnapian critiques of logical empiricism, especially by the three great epistemologists of the 1950s, Chisholm, Quine, and Sellers. So let's start, and I will share the screen with the notes, and let's talk a little bit about Carnap and Quine. So we ended up here um, when we were talking about Carnap. The idea for Carnap was you have two choices. You have a choice about which language to speak, but once you speak a language, verification principles will be built into the understanding of the language. Now, he snuck in the verification principles stuff without argument, but it's pretty clear that what he's doing is presupposing a verificationist theory of meaning uh, and not arguing for it because he builds epistemology into what he calls the rules of grammar for a language. Well, they can't be built into the syntax. Verification conditions don't show up in the syntax. So he must be thinking, Ah, but you'll find them in the semantics for the language. Um, and he should have also been aware, should have realized that you don't get that for free because the entire tradition of first order logic from Frege onward is in terms of a truth theoretic semantics rather than a verification theoretic semantics. So when you do standard semantics in first order logic, you just talk about the extensions of predicate letters, the things in the world that fall under the scope of the predicate that satisfy the predicate. And then you calculate the truth value of sentences. And the entire point of the semantics is to build up enough machinery that you can calculate the truth value of a complex sentence from the syntactic components and the interpretation that they're given in the semantics. So when you get to the end of the Carnap piece that we read, it's a bit of a shock to see what he says. To accept the thing world means nothing more than to accept a certain form of language. Okay, so let's, let's let that part go. Let's say, okay, there is a pragmatic decision you have to make about which language to speak. But then he says, in other words, to accept rules for forming statements and for testing, accepting, or rejecting them. Now, this in other words phrase is a rather astonishing thing to say because this has a whole bunch of epistemology built into it and this has no epistemology built into it. There is nothing up here about rules for testing, accepting, or rejecting them. So the idea that I'm just rephrasing what I said up here is monstrously misleading. He is not merely rephrasing unless you presuppose a verificationist theory of meaning together with Carnap. Now, it's not surprising if he were to embrace a verificationist or confirmationist theory of meaning. What is surprising is that you can get away with presupposing it and not defending it explicitly in an article without even acknowledging that that's what you're doing. But that, in fact, is what Carnap is doing in that paper. In fact, it characterizes his work more generally. Everything that can't be accounted for in terms of verification or confirmation conditions is to be accounted for in terms of pragmatic choices having nothing to do with truth or falsity or meaning in general. So you get choices about what language you're going to speak. You get When you turn to confirmation theory, Carnap ends up endorsing that there are choices to be made about which functions are going to count as confirmation or disconfirmation functions. But those choices will be pragmatic, not ones that are cognitively significant enough to threaten the underlying verificationism. On to Quine now. Quine is not a fan of what Carnap says in the article that we read. I keep forgetting the name of that article. I think it's Empiricism, Semantics, and Ontology, but let's look back. Oh, it doesn't say in my notes. Okay, whatever the title of the article is, let's go back to this. Both Quine and Carnap have significant pragmatist elements. 
in their story. The difference is that for Carnap, the pragmatic elements are part of a demarcation proposal separating metaphysics and objectionable philosophy from the purely theoretical work involved in the arena of testability. For Quine, the pragmatism is more fundamental. It plays a role in the acceptance of any theoretical structure of any sort that goes beyond the data of sensory stimulation. So you can look at Quine as a very honest, serious human, that all we have to go on are the data of sensory stimulation and everything beyond the data. The story to be told is a pragmatist story of one sort or another. Now, pragmatism is not, I mean, it's a school of views that's very hard to characterize generally. So you can find people citing something as a pragmatic element of a certain philosophical point of view. And um, if you feel a little bit murky on exactly what that might mean or involve, join the crowd. It is murky. It's not clear that there's any essence to what it is to be a pragmatist. There's just various inclinations of one sort or another. So here's a pragmatist view going back to William James. Truth is what works, which is uh, quite easy to make fun of, <clears throat> which Russell did. And uh, James claimed to have been misunderstood by Russell. In fact, he claims that Russell intentionally tried to misunderstand him because, of course, what James said was supposed to be a really deep and important truth. And anybody who's making fun of a deep and important truth just isn't trying very hard. Uh, but in any case, the point is pragmatism ties the theoretical realm and the practical realm together in ways that um, non-pragmatists would reject. In order to talk about the prospects for pragmatism, though, you need a specific proposal in front of you. Um, the proposal that truth is what works is such a specific proposal. And then various pragmatist proposals along those lines are quite easy to raise objections to. Doesn't mean pragmatism in general is to be rejected, but um, we will see by the end of the article what Quine's particular pragmatist take is on the story. So the paper you read, Two Dogmas of Empiricism, falls into two parts. The first part addresses the two dogmas and in particular does it in the context of wanting, wanting to raise objections to Carnap's particular proposals about what empiricism involves. The second part of the article is a hand-wavy characterization of what Quine thinks the truth of the matter is. Now, Two Dogmas of Empiricism would not be a famous paper if it was just the first part. Sometimes when you read analytic philosophers and look at what work is paid the most attention to, you can easily get the impression that the more technical, the more careful, the more articulate people are when using formal symbols and seeing where problems arise for other views, the better the work will be received. But I think that's a mistake. I think that's maybe the difference between what's going on at the conscious level and what's going on at a less conscious level. At the conscious level, the demand for precision and carefulness in the work being done is something that's been explicit all the way back to Frege and other um, parts of the mid to late 19th century. We've seen the demand for precision and clarity come up over and over and over again. So you might think, well, that's the defining characteristic of this tradition, and that's what uh, the kind of work has to look like in order for it to be paid attention to. I think that's not quite right. I think big picture views that try to um, tell you in broad strokes what the lay of the land looks like end up becoming the most famous parts of the tradition. Now, you can't, there's nothing you can do to slough the demand for precision and clarity, but Precision and clarity alone doesn't make for a famous paper. And Two Dogmas is a particularly good example of this because even though there's an aura of carefulness in the first part of the article, 
there's also a bit of murkiness where you're not quite sure what Carna, I mean, what Quine is getting at. He likes to resort to flowery language at times, and sometimes you don't quite know exactly what he thinks he's up to. But by the second half of the article, you see a vision for what he thinks things should look like from a proper epistemology. And then you think you understand better what his complaints might be in the first part of the article. So let's talk about the first part of the article first and the mysteries that seem to arise when we try to make sense of it. So first, Quine begins by saying there are two dogmas that he wants to reject. He's not going to reject empiricism, but he is going to reject these dogmas. So the first one is the synthetic analytic distinction. As he puts it, there is a distinction between sentences, the truth of which depends both on the meanings of its words and the facts, and sentences, the truth of which depends only on the meaning of the words. Second is analytic, first is synthetic. That's the first one. The second one doesn't actually seem connected to the first one. They seem like they're independent and unrelated claims. The second claim is every meaningful sentence is a logical construct of terms referring to immediate sense experience, and so may itself be confirmed or disconfirmed by experience. Now, I, I want you to notice there's a link between these two parts of number two. It's, it's, um, it's essential to understand this link and why the first part and the second part aren't the same and how the two might come apart as well. So look at the first part. Every meaningful sentence is a logical construct of terms referring to immediate sense experience. Every meaningful sentence is. Okay, there are empiricists who hold such a view I think the cleanest version of such a view is uh, Bertrand Russell's logical atomism, where everything is a logical con construct out of the logical atoms, and the logical atoms themselves are sense data statements. Everything else gets constructed out of that. Now, I want you also to notice that when you endorse a view like this, you have shown yourself to be an anti-realist when it comes to understanding science. So the standard form of anti-realism in the philosophy of science is called instrumentalism. And in the early part of the 20th century, almost all physicists were instrumentalists. They thought the theoretical language of science was not to be taken seriously, except as a way, as a tool for inferring the, from the set of experiences that we have to sets of experiences that we will have. Good science is a matter of building theories that allow us to predict the future. And once we can predict, um, there's always in the background a hope that we can control as well. But tools aren't to be taken seriously as descriptions of what the world is like. Instead, they're just inference machines that allow us to go from one body of experiences to predictions about other bodies of experience, and that's all there is to it. Now notice, if every meaningful sentence were a logical construct out of terms referring to immediate sense experience, that would be precisely the right attitude to take towards science, because science is not special in any way. Everything would be subject to the same demands. So if you think, just think about being a realist about ordinary size objects, trees, chairs, um, houses, people, all those sorts of things. Um, I don't know about you and the people in the room with you, if there are any, but the people in my house don't strike me as sense experiences. And sentences about my wife and uh, furniture in our house don't strike me as the kind of sense data statements that uh, Russell would take to be foundational. So all of those have to be constructed logically from statements about immediate sense data. Um, 
That means if you take that seriously, that means you're going to end up being a phenomenalist. You're going to end up being an idealist of at least a Barclayan sort, where all talk about material objects, ordinary physical objects, and that sort of thing is going to be constructed out of bundles of terms and sentences referring to immediate sense experience. So the first half of number two is a strongly anti-realist, instrumentalist, phenomenalistic commitment on the part of ordinary empiricism. That's the metaphysical implications of the first part of the second dogma. The second half of the second dogma, the last line in my notes, and so may itself be disconfirmed or confirmed by experience. That's the epistemology. So what's the connection between the strong anti-realist overtones of the metaphysics that's being endorsed and the confirmation theory that's supposed to result from it? Well, this is a guiding principle which is going to turn out to be super important when we come to look at Chisholm's criticisms of logical empiricism and basically empiricistic uh, views in general. The idea is this. I'm, I'm going to pull up the writing tools, so feel free to speed up the video if my writing is so slow that it's hard to listen to at the ordinary speed. All right, so we have sense data statements. And then we have everything else. And somehow the meaning of the sense data statement, statements put together in collections, is supposed to give us the meaning of material object statements. No matter how empirical looking the statement might be, like if you say there's a tree out the window across the street, that sounds like an observation statement, but it's not actually an observation statement because the only thing to which you have empirical access to is the stuff that gets encoded in sense data statements. So anything that's not the content of a sense data statement will count as something that has to be constructed out of sense data statements. All right, now if we get this meaning equivalence, we can turn those into logical relationships from one side to the other side. A certain body of sense data statements will entail a material object statement, and a material object statement will entail sense data statements. So we get it running in both ways. And from this, we get what I will call the high school understanding of scientific methodology. The high school understanding of scientific methodology is that the way you go about testing and confirming scientific theories is you take a look at the theory and you try to figure out what it entails about experience. So let the theory be H. You've got a particular scientific theory and you want to test it. I don't care what it is. How do you do that? You figure out what it entails about experience. And then here's the guiding principle, which we find in this last linking claim that Quine is making, attaching the second half of the second dogma to the first half. The slogan is confirmation is the mirror image of entailment. So why is it that E is capable of confirming H? Answer, because H entails E. It's in virtue of and only in virtue of this background entailment claim that we can ever say the confirmation exists between evidence and a hypothesis. So that's the crucial thing. And notice that's precisely what two is claiming. It says, first, there are logical connections between statements about immediate sense experience and 
everything else that has a meaning. And because of these logical relationships, we can get confirmation or disconfirmation by experience. Now that's absolutely essential to understanding everything about logical empiricism and the history of analytic philosophy in its epistemology since the 50s. Confirmation is the mirror image of entailment, and that's what the high school understanding of science is. Now, you might want to know why I'm disparaging this view by referring it to the high school understanding, because um, that's a little bit unfair to people in the, say, 1920s and 30s who were fancy philosophers and embraced this picture. A.J. Ayer, for example, in Language, Truth, and Logic, um, gives a theory of confirmation that is precisely of this sort. Um, so what's so bad about this picture? Well, here's the fact that this is an exaggeration of. Let me see if I can write this here. I'll do it right here. The high school understanding says, I'm having trouble talking and writing. Can you tell? That says prediction. The high school understanding says confirmation is the mirror of entailment. The correct thing to say is confirmation is the mirror of prediction. So this is a weaker claim to make than the stronger one. The weaker thing says, how do we go about testing a hypothesis? Well, we look at what it predicts. If that theory is true, what should we expect the course of experience to look like? Once you get that calculation done, you then have the material you need to go about testing the theory. Namely, you look to see if the predictions are accurate. That's the way science works. Now, what's the difference? Well, entailment, if a hypothesis actually does entail a piece of evidence, of course it predicts it. But the other direction is not true. A hypothesis can predict a certain, that a certain thing will happen without entailing that it happens. And that difference will turn out to be super important when we get to Chisholm. So this is about the history of uh, probability theory and confirmation theory. Uh, basically between the end of the First World War and the beginning and the end of the Second World War. And it starts with John Maynard uh, Keynes' book, A Treatise on Probability, which was published in 1921. So what we're trying to do, we're looking at the period between Keynes' work and that of Carl Hempel in 1945, so basically the end of the Second World War. So here's what Keynes said. He said he wanted a logical and objective notion of probability. And it took at least 45 years for people, well, maybe only 40, but at least by the time of Carnap in the early to mid 60s, people have learned that you can't have what you want here. Um, so Keynes had in mind the following, an early way of connecting Keynes ideas of wanting a logical and objective notion of probability. He wanted that, by the way, because he wanted this notion of probability to uh, generate a theory of confirmation. So a good way to do that is to think of confirmation as the inverse of entailment, that when a hypothesis entails a bit of information, that information, when you discover it, confirms the hypothesis. Um, and an early version of this approach, you can call it the hypothetico-deductive, approach to confirmation is in A.J. Ayer's 1936 Language, Truth, and Logic. So here's what Ayer said. Ayer doesn't actually think the hypothesis all by itself has to entail the evidence, because that hardly ever happens. Just think about um, the oxygen theory of combustion. What explains con combustion, at least in large part, is the presence of oxygen not the presence of something else like phlogiston. Okay, so suppose you embrace the oxygen theory of combustion. And I'm holding 
a match, which I took out of a back box of matches, and it has a strike plate on the side of the box. So what does the oxygen theory of combustion entail about what's going to happen when I strike the match to the side of the box? Does the combustion theory of, does the oxygen theory of combustion entail that the match will light when struck? No, it clearly does not. For one thing, I might not strike it hard enough. For another thing, you have struck matches that turned out to be duds, so they didn't light. For a third thing, um, I didn't tell you whether I'm underwater or not right now, or whether I had put the box of matches with the match underwater. Um, and I'm pretty sure if you strike the match when you're underwater, not much is gonna happen. So Ayer realized we have to be a little bit more careful about this. We don't want to claim that the hypothesis itself has to entail the evidence. There are going to be auxiliary assumptions or hypotheses at work in generating the entailment. So here's what we're gonna say. Look for some auxiliary hypotheses that describe the context that we're in, the particular nature of the situation we find ourselves in. Put those together with the hypothesis, and here's what we want. We want the auxiliary hypotheses alone not to entail E, but when put together with the hypothesis, they do entail E without also generating a contradiction. Okay, so that's a bit more sophisticated than the high school understanding that I made fun of on the last, uh, on the notes when I was scribbling there. But it's still a version of the view that confirmation is the mirror image of entailment. Okay, now you might want to know, why do I think that's still a sophomoric view? Maybe we went from high school to college, and now, you're, now I'm accusing Ayer of having all of the insight of a college sophomore. By the way, if you want to see why I'm making fun of sophomores, just look at the etymology of the word sophomore, and then think about the what adverb form, what is it to be sophomoric? Uh, that's what I have in mind. So sophomores are to be um, cherished because they grow up, they turn into juniors and seniors, and then they're no longer sophomoric. So that's yeah, fine. Everybody's a sophomore at some point in their life, um, unless they don't make it that far. But in any case, this is what I call a sophomoric understanding. So we're going to add auxiliary hypotheses, and now they're going to entail H. Okay. Now, this can be ridiculed in the simplest sort of ways. Here's my favorite auxiliary hypothesis. H arrow E. So does H arrow E by itself entail E? Nope, not a chance. Does it entail E in conjunction with H? Yes, it does. That's called modus ponens. And it also doesn't entail not H, unless, of course, H itself is logically inconsistent, and then it entails everything. But let's assume H is consistent. We now have a recipe for an auxiliary hypothesis that doesn't by itself entail the evidence, but does entail the evidence in conjunction with H. So now ask yourself what values for H and E don't generate confirmation from E to H? The answer is only in one case where H is true and E is false. Because in that case, this auxiliary hypothesis is not true. In every other case, if they're both false, if they're both true, or if E is true and H is false, H arrow E is true. So take any two truths. Each of them always confirms the other. Take any two falsehoods. On this account, each of them confirms the other. No matter what the values for E and H happen to be, and finally, so long as 
E itself is true, it confirms absolutely everything. This is an astonishingly overreaching theory of confirmation. It gets you confirmation between absolutely unrelated things, things that have zero to do with each other. It gets you confirmation between Caesar's crossing the Rubicon and Trump's announcement today that they were shutting down the Canadian border. I don't care what you think, but I, I don't care what you think about the crossing of the border and whether you have confirmation for thinking that Trump shut down the border. I assume you did, but you didn't get confirmation from thinking about Caesar's crossing the Rubicon. So this is a confirmation theory that overreaches dramatically. Now, in the face of um, the counterexample, counterexamples that I'm drawing attention to, it's pretty obvious what Ayer would say. He would say, well, H arrow E is not the right kind of auxiliary hypothesis. The right kind are gonna be hypotheses that draw attention to features of the situation that you find yourself in for testing purposes. So go back to my theory of combustion case with the, mat with the matchboxes, matches in the matchbox. An auxiliary hypothesis is supposed to be something about the situation in which I'm about to strike the match. So one auxiliary assumption would be I'm not underwater. Okay, that's fine. Air would say that's an appropriate value for the auxiliary hypothesis, but H arrow E isn't an appropriate value. All right, now if you're attracted to this view, that's exactly what you should try to do. You should try to say what are admissible values for these auxiliary hypotheses and what aren't because it's too easy to ridicule this proposal if you don't put some restrictions here. But at the same time, now you've made your task very hard. First, you have to tell me what the restrictions are, but second, you now are committed to something that's not obvious is true anymore. Um, so take these descriptions of the situation with the matches. Um, so I'm not underwater. And the oxygen, we're still assuming the oxygen theory of combustion is true. Add that theory together with I'm not underwater. Does the conjunction of H with me not being underwater entail that the match strikes when lit? Well, it's pretty obvious that that's not enough. You're going to have to have more than I'm not underwater. For example, when the humidity level goes up really high, matches are harder to light. So you have to have something about the humidity level not being too high. What else? You have to have that the strike plate on the matchbox um, has not deteriorated over time so that it's been used so much it doesn't really do its job anymore. You keep adding in these bits of information and each time you ask yourself, well, do I now have enough information to entail E, to make it impossible that the match not light when struck, provided those assumptions together with the hypothesis are true. And it's not clear that you're gonna be able to get all of that information in there. Now, it would be easy to describe auxiliary hypotheses that are all by themselves strong enough to entail E, but clause one says that's, that's not allowed. You can't have auxiliary hypotheses that entail E. For example, your auxiliary hypothesis can't be E itself, nor can it be a conjunction of E together with anything else. That too will entail E, but clause one says that's cheating. Okay, so the takeaway lesson here is the high school understanding of the connection between um, the entailment claim and confirmation really is uh, too facile, but so is this sophomoric understanding. So it's not surprising, but this approach to confirmation uh, did not have serious um, influence on the work done on confirmation going into the um, 1940s and 50s. It really wasn't a very impressive attempt to understand how confirmation worked. So here's where we were. We were characterizing the two dogmas. 
the one that gets the most paid the most attention is Klein's attack on the analytic synthetic distinction. So we'll look at that in a moment. But to my mind, the one that deserves the most scrutiny is the second claim. It gives a certain anti-realist, idealist kind of empiricist viewpoint that we're going to have to build up truth conditions and meaning conditions for every sentence out of truth conditions and sentences referring solely to immediate sense experience. And we have to do this because confirmation stands or falls with the entailment view. Unless we can have the logical construction of theoretical and hypothetical claims out of immediate sense experience, we won't be able to get a theory of confirmation that works at all. So call that the entailment confirmation duality claim. What I claimed was there is a duality here, but it's not entailment and confirmation. It is rather prediction and confirmation. And we'll come back to that when we look at Chisholm. But let's move forward and talk about the analytic synthetic distinction. So the first dogma is supposed by the positivist to explain the special status of math and logic. So if you're a hardcore empiricist, um, you're likely to say things that overreach a bit, like the senses are all we ever have to go on to figure out what the world is like. Well, um, that overreaches because you clearly know things that you didn't learn from your senses alone. You might call attention to the role of testimony in most of your knowledge. And then there'd be hand waving on the part of the empiricist and says, yeah, 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 that's fine. You learned a whole bunch from your grandmother, but your grandmother learned her stuff either from her own sensory experiences or from the sensory experiences of those that she learned her stuff from. So, things still are bottoming out in terms of sensory experience. And then the rationalists all said to the empiricists, well, tell us what you think about math and logic, because that certainly doesn't look like sensory-based knowledge. Now, most empiricists agreed, you don't learn the math and logic stuff that you know based on sensory experience. There are some outliers here. The most famous is John Stuart Mill, who thought, no, nope, it is sensory experience that gives you the knowledge you have of mathematics. Um, and it might seem like that's what's going on when you just look at it in a very cursory, cursory way, because think about how you learned simple arithmetic. Uh, probably one of your early elementary school teachers uh, did something like the one I had did. She had a basket, she put two apples in it, she picked up two more apples and put it in and then had us count how many apples there were in the basket. And she said, so you see, that's, that shows you that two plus two equals four. And that's how we came to understand uh, simple arithmetic. Um, it's a generalization of very simple examples like that. The problem is that um, if, you took that, if you took that proposal seriously and thought knowledge of mathematics comes it empirically in that way, you'd end up saying that most of the time two plus two is four. For there are other empirical contexts in which nothing of the sort seems to work out right. So you take a little test tube, you're in a chemistry lab, you take a test tube and you've got um, an eyedropper with some water in it. And so you put in one drop of water into the test tube, another drop of water, another drop of water, and another drop of water. So you put in four drops of water, and then you look in the test tube, and you try to count the drops of water, and you say, oh crap, there's only one. So apparently sometimes one plus one plus one plus one is one. But nobody would be tempted to do that, and that's because you use your knowledge of mathematical structures to interpret the experience differently. This isn't a case of adding one to itself four times. It is instead a case that should be understood in terms of volume, not numbers. It should be viewed as a case where you took a certain volume of water and repeated it four times. So you should have four times as much 
in terms of volume as you had when you started. So notice what you're doing. You're using the special status of math and logic to give a reinterpretation of the experience rather than using the experience to undermine a simple fact about basic arithmetic. That's the standard view is mathematical understanding is something we bring to experience to properly understand its structure. We don't elicit the mathematical knowledge from the experience itself. So hardly any empiricists were willing to go along with John Stuart Mill in thinking that mathematical knowledge comes through experience or depends exclusively on experience. Instead, they said, no, math and logic, that's a different kind of thing. Math and logic is not something that you need experience to understand. It's not synthetic knowledge. It is instead knowledge that you glean simply by knowing the meanings of the terms. Now, Quine is a skeptic about this notion of meaning. On the surface, it doesn't seem like the notion of meaning should be especially problematic. But when you start asking questions, you get explanations that quickly turn circular. So you say, what, what do you mean by analytic? And the empiricists say, oh, it's a case where the sentence is either true or false in a way that depends only on the meanings of the terms. And then you say, well, when do two terms have the same meaning? And the answer is, well, when they're synonymous. But of course, that's not a very helpful explanation because synonymy just means sameness of meaning. And that's the first thing that Quine points out. Quine says, the notion of synonymy here is no clearer than the notion that you were trying to clarify in the first place. They actually just, synonymy just means sameness of meaning. So he's not happy yet. Now, at this point in the article, before we get to Carnap, Quine presents a partial gift to, to the empiricist. He says, look, there, there is a certain kind of analyticity that I'm gonna let you have. So if you want something like this, Uh, excuse this truly horrendous kindergarten level writing. Take the sentence, red stuff is red. Klein says, I'm, gonna let, I, I'm not going to complain about this kind of analyticity. Red stuff is red is a sentence that turns out to be true in virtue of its logical form alone. There's nothing about needing to replace one of the terms with a synonymous phrase in order to get the sentence to come out true in virtue of its logical form. This one comes out to be true in virtue of its logical form right off the bat with no substitution of any sort needed. So he says, I'm fine with that notion of analyticity. Analyticity in virtue of logical form alone, I'm fine with. It's the other kind, the kind that depends on substituting synonyms for synonyms that I'm not real happy about. Okay, now th that's worth noting, but it's also worth noting that um, Quine is giving up too much because you can't get, you can't tell me what the logical form of this sentence is without assuming that there's no ambiguity from the first use of red to the second one. Remember, ambiguous expressions are where you have the same word and it has different meanings in the two cases. Like think of bank and bank, well, river banks and financial institutions. If you use the sentence, if you say banks are banks, um, that's not an analytic truth. In fact, it's pretty much an obvious falsehood if you read the first use of bank as referring to river banks and the second one as referring to financial institutions. So before you can find that this is the same, this is a sentence true in virtue of its logical form, you have to have already decided these two words are used with the same meaning. So Quine could have been more skeptical than he was about this notion of analyticity. So you're looking at this sentence, you probably understood the bank example pretty clearly, but how could this be an ambiguous sentence? 
Well, remember, red can be a color and it can also be a communist. Um, so if I say red stuff is red, I might mean red stuff, communist stuff is always red. Or I could mean red colored stuff is always communist in one way or another. That would be a weird thing for me to be saying out loud. I don't know why I'd say it, but I'm just pointing out that finding the logical form of a sentence already presupposes that you've made a decision about what the meanings of the terms are. So he could have been more cranky about the class of analytic truths. He tried to be nice and say, I'll give you some, but the ones that depend on sameness of meaning, I'm not so happy about. The fact is all of them depend on sameness of meaning. Okay. On to how this links up with Carnap. So he then turns to Carnap and says, here's what Carnap tried to do. Carnap tried to clarify analyticity relative to semantic rules. So what he had was specify a language and then I can tell you what analyticity in L means and Carnap hyphenated just like that. Now I talked about this in class when we talked about Carnap and um, if you remember, I said, Look at these two words, whoops. What do those two words have to do with each other? Well, not the words, but what do crates and rats have to do with each other? Uh, pretty much not much. We know what a crate is, we know what a rat is, they're just different kinds of things. They are different creatures. In fact, one, the first one's an artifact, the second one is a natural kind. That's a quite important divide between kinds of things in the world. So Quine didn't make this very clear, but part of what he's worried about is, um, you were supposed to be telling me something about analyticity in analyticity itself, and what you did was you changed to talking about this other notion, analyticity in L, and I don't have a clue how that connects up with analyticity itself any more than if I ask you to tell me what a rat is and you start talking about crates, I don't think we're on the same page anymore. We're not communicating very well. So Quine first says, no, I really need an account of analyticity itself and you can't give me that by just talking about analyticity in L. Um, and I think Carnap is guilty of a confusion here because if you look back at what he said, he thinks the sentence L designates L is itself always analytic. And the fact is, if it's just analytic analyticity itself you're talking about, this is most clearly not an analytic sentence. It kind of looks like one because uh, the meta language and the object language are, what's the right word? Um, homologous, is that the right word? There is a word for this. Um, homophonic might be the right word, right? So you're building the object language in which L, the first L occurs into the meta language. And it turns out this use of L and that use of L just happened to coincide. The use of this term in the object language coincides with the use of this term in the meta language. But suppose you just take the object language to be something other than English. Um, so let's let L be love. In Spanish, L would then be something about uh, maybe this stands for yo te amo. That means I love you. You probably already knew that. All right, now that's not a term, but just take yo. Take the first part. Yo, in Spanish, designates me. Now, nobody in their right mind would think that's analytic because the two languages don't overlap in the way that they do when both the object language and the meta language are going to be versions of English. So he might have said, 
Well, on my proposal, that sentence counts as analytic in L, but it certainly does not count as analytic, full stop. Okay, so how about this? Quine's, Quine does some work, makes some complaints about various proposals to tell us what sameness of meaning amounts to, and then he says, this all looks pretty hopeless, let's turn to the verificationist criterion itself and say, that analytic truths are those that are confirmed come what may. Now it's at this point that we start seeing what Quine's positive views start to look like. So he first talks about what has come to be called the quine duhem thesis. Duhem was Pierre de Duhem, a physicist from the early part of the 20th century. Duhem had this thesis and applied it. He, he didn't have the thesis itself. He had a particular version of it for physics that when you do an experiment in physics and things don't go the way that you were anticipating, you have some choices to make about what to conclude. And there's always more than one choice about what to conclude given um, a recalcitrant exper experiment. Quine took that Duhem thesis in physics and applied it more generally. He said, there's no verification except at the level of sensory input that doesn't depend on auxiliary assumptions. You're always making auxiliary assumptions. So in principle, anything other than purely sensory reports can withstand any amount of testing if you make enough changes elsewhere. So you, you run an experiment and it goes badly. What do you conclude? Well, you ran the experiment because you had a hypothesis in mind that you were testing. And the fact that the experiment went uh, the, a way you didn't expect shows that one thing you could do is decide that your hypothesis is mistaken. That's not the only thing that you can decide. You can decide that one of your auxiliary assumptions is mistaken. That's what happened when, um, let's see, how does this work? Neptune was discovered. The discovery of Neptune occurred when they used Newtonian mechanics and some other things about Kepler's laws and things like that to predict where Uranus was supposed to be in the sky and they built a satellite, a satellite telescope um, and looked, and Uranus wasn't anywhere close to where it was supposed to be. Now, that's a case where the experiment turned out to be recalcitrant with respect to the hypothesis that you were testing. They were using this as a way of testing um, Newton's laws of motion. So one option is to say, well, I guess Newton was wrong. I don't know what the tr true laws are, but they're not what Sir Isaac said they were. Now, nobody actually thought that. What they did instead was they said, oh, I guess some of the assumptions that we made in doing our calculations were mistaken. In particular, when they did the calculations, they made assumptions about what the large body masses were that were exerting measurable uh, differences on the orbit of Uranus. And they thought there weren't any planets beyond Uranus. So one assumption was, um, there aren't any other planets outside further out that we haven't observed or postulated yet. That's the one that turned out most people rejected. So the point is, if you're willing to reject some of these auxiliary assumptions, you can hang on to any particular hypothesis that you're testing, come what may. And remember, that's the thought. That's the thought that he's after. Let's just try the epistemological route to analyticity and say analytic truths are those that are confirmed, retained, come what may. Well, the quine duhem thesis shows any sentence can have that status for you, but not all those sentences should be counted as analytic. The point is that if confirmation is holistic in the way Quine is describing, in the way implied by the quine duhem thesis, that makes radical reductionism unsustainable because you can't identify the particular sensory experiences that attach to particular sentences that are not about sensory experiences. They don't get grouped in the right way. And so Quine said, that's the last chance you had at maintaining some remnant of the analytic synthetic distinction. He then concludes, so at bottom, the two dogmas are really one, that the truth of a sentence can be divided into a factual and a linguistic component. 
notice that's where the holism about confirmation was designed to bring us, that there isn't any such division to be made. There is just the totality of what you think being wrought up against experience over and over and over again with you making the kind of changes that strike you as the ones that you should be making given the experiences that you had. And that's all of a piece. It doesn't matter where you make the changes or whatever. You're just applying the Klein Duen thesis at the personal level. And we could do this at the corporate level too. So the scientific community as a group could do precisely the same thing. It's just all one big holistic adjustment in the face of recal recalcitrant experience. And sometimes you're more wedded to some claims than others. And so you keep hanging on to them, but that doesn't mean they're analytic. There is no such thing to be talked about. There's only stuff that's buried deeper and more uh, insulated from being abandoned. But that's a psychological fact about how human beings and how human communities work. It's not a logical fact about which sentences count as analytic and which ones as synthetic. Okay, that's the first part of the article. And then he, in quick order, paints you a big picture. And it's the big picture that um, attracted people's interests. Even though there's not any serious attempt here to fill in the details, what he does is he says, I'm going to tell you what I think a dogma-free empiricism would look like. To reject the dogma, both dogmas, or the root one dogma, is to reject the idea that the truth of a sentence can be divided into a factual and a linguistic component such that it can be individually confirmed or disconfirmed by experience. That idea has to be given up. And the new part here is, can you do this? Does confirmation and disconfirmation um, occur item by item? His answer is, no, it doesn't. The right way to understand belief and the implications of confirmation holism is that the web of belief as a whole is brought to experience and confirmed or disconfirmed by it. So sometimes your entire web of belief confronts experience and the experience conforms to what you were expecting. So sometimes your beliefs gel with experience and sometimes they don't. When they don't gel, we have to revise. I suppose you could reject the experience itself, but let's not, uh, I mean, sometimes you just decide, well, that was, I don't know what happened there, but that was illusory. So you can do that, but, that, but that's a way of revising your opinions. You revise your opinion about trusting your experience. So that's one way to do it. But since our beliefs are interrelated in the way Klein describes, revising, confirming, and disconfirming entails doing so for a web. And revisability is always in place for everything. Even, Klein says, for principles such as the law of excluded middle, even for such principles as bivalence. Now, the logicians uh, that were around at the time began howling because they didn't think that made any sense. And Quine later on um, revised his view and said, well, maybe those are so settled that they are not, in fact, revisable. But that doesn't show that they're analytic because we don't know what that is. They are just things that have achieved a status for us so that we won't give those up come what may, but that doesn't make them analytic. Finally, how is it that we go about making such changes? According to Klein, we do so conservatively. We favor the least disruptive adjustments to the web of belief. So the picture here is you have a web of, of belief. Some of it, the experience confronts the web at its periphery. Some of the parts of the web are closer to the periphery than others, and some is more embedded in the heart of the web. And the stuff that's at the heart of the web is much more difficult to revise. And as a species, Quine holds that here's how we, in fact, behave. We favor the least disruptive adjustments to the web, which means in most cases, 
the less entrenched peripheral elements of the web will be adjusted to accommodate the new experience. The internal, more embedded parts of the web will remain constant. But this is just a psychological story to be told, not a logical one. I thought that's where my notes ended on Quine. So Quine gives up the analytic synthetic distinction. He replaces the confirmation. What's the opposite of holism? I guess atomism. The atomistic conception of confirmation is something that he wants to reject. Confirmation is not simply a relationship between a hypothesis and a bit of evidence, but it's rather a holistic relationship between an experience a hypothesis and the entire background system of belief that you have. Now that last view, the holism part that I just described, Carnap shared with Quine. Carnap too thought confirmation was relative to background systems of information. He didn't take that to undermine the objectivity of confirmation or anything like that. And Quine doesn't take it to do that either, although Quine's not interested so much in talking about whether confirmation is objective or subjective, he just says, um, let's turn this over to the psychologists and let them tell us how we, in fact, make revisions to our systems of belief in light of experiences that don't fit with our system of beliefs. And then when they're done telling us that, that's all there is to be said. Uh, this is called Quine's naturalistic epistemology. Um, and he wrote an article in 1969 laying this out very straightforwardly, uh, and then proceeded to say that he didn't say what was in that article, because it sounded like it was replacing all of epistemology with psychology. That's what people said. It looked like he was saying, and he said, oh, no, that's not what I had in mind at all. But the paper itself is uh, fairly straightforward. That is what he was proposing. I think what he should have said is, I'm just taking it back. Anyway, that's enough about Quine. If Quine is right, the central core of logical empiricism has to be abandoned because you can't separate confirmation from meaning in the way Carnap and the logical empiricists thought it needed to be separated.